Welcome to Fertility Cafe, the home for every conversation exploring alternative family building through IVF, surrogacy, egg, sperm, and embryo donation. Our host, Eloise Drain, alternates episodes between educational shows covering specific topics and guest narratives for further insight. For a mastery, understanding, and confidence in all things alternative family, subscribe to Fertility Cafe. Hey there, welcome to episode 100 of Fertility Cafe. As Fertility Cafe's 100th episode, we're looking ahead to the future of the industry and the future of humanity's fertility as a whole. What challenges are we currently facing and how will they evolve over time? What new challenges do we anticipate on the horizon? How will changes in fertility on such a massive scale affect society, culture, and the way the world views third-party reproduction? What science or technology needs to be advanced in order for us to experience true, impactful change that's scalable? My guest on today's show is David Sable. David is a highly accomplished and influential figure in the field of reproductive medicine. With degrees from the Wharton School and the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, he has excelled as an obstetrician and a gynecologist specializing in reproductive endocrinology. As a co-founder of the Institute for Reproductive Medicine and Sciences and Reprogenetics, he played a pivotal role in their successful acquisitions. He is a respected educator, teaching at Columbia University and delivering lectures on healthcare investing and biotechnology business development at renowned institutions. He has also appeared on major news networks to discuss reproductive medicine innovations with numerous board positions, advisory roles, and a wide range of publications to his credit. David has made lasting contributions to the field and is recognized as a distinguished leader in reproductive medicine, healthcare policy, and entrepreneurship. Welcome David to the show. You have, as I mentioned, an quite an impressive background. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Perfect. So I am going to jump right in as I have a lot of questions to ask. And this show is about the future of infertility. And as we look ahead to the future of the fertility industry, it's important to address the challenges it currently faces and how they evolve over time. Could you share your insights on the current and anticipated challenges in the field? Yeah, IVF has come so far. Mm. I started doing it in the late 80s, early 90s. Frankly, it wasn't that good a procedure. Every, you know, 10 million babies over 40 years, everyone's a miracle. Each one is an honor to be able to participate in care of people. But the chance of getting pregnant each time we did it was lower than we would have wanted it to be. There were enormous groups of people that we weren't treating at all who could have benefited hugely, both for infertility and for other indications like habitual miscarriage and genetic disease prevention. And over time, we've just gotten better and better at it to the point where now the biggest problem isn't making the procedure work most of the time, although we still have a lot of work to do there. The biggest problem is getting it to people. It's access. Mm-hmm. You know, we really need to uh, kind of run the technology playbook and make it from a superbly scientific, not very well engineered system to one that works, you know, kind of like clockwork. You know, it's like a hotel industry where we just have the Four Seasons and the Ritz Carlton, mm-hmm. and everybody else has to sleep on people's couches. Mm-hmm. And really, now the big challenge we face is one where we need the the engineering of IVF to match the science of IVF. What scientific or technological breakthroughs do you think is necessary for us to achieve that change? Well, we break them out into two, two areas. You know, one are things that have already been discovered that are being used elsewhere in other industries. And this goes back to fluid handling, cell handling, efficient labeling, replacing people doing repetitious tasks that some people do them well, some people don't do them that well. And everybody, if you do too much of it, you get tired. Mm -hmm. A lot of these things can be automated. 
And this is going back to the old Henry Ford assembly line. Yeah, you know, things just make it fast, make it measurable, make it reproducible, just in an efficiency standpoint. On the scientific side, there are things that have been vexing for us for dozens or hundreds of years, you know, learning things about what makes a good sperm cell mm -hmm. versus what doesn't. How do we take care of people whose eggs are not responding to stimulation or they don't, once fertilized, they don't divide well, things of that sort. And how do we figure out what makes for an embryo implanting and continuing to grow rather than implanting and then stopping? Some of these things, we have some answers, but not complete answers. More importantly, we don't have a way of taking the knowledge that we've gained from the scientific advancements and necessarily use it so that an individual has a higher chance of conceiving when they need to, when, when we do an IVF cycle, or even more importantly, fixing things they don't need IVF at all. One of the things that I know that is a, in rapid progress is genetic research, screening technologies. Can you discuss how these areas can contribute to improving those outcomes? I was really fortunate to work with some of the pioneers in this area going back as early as the early 1990s. And when we first started doing IVF, you know, we would kind of put the sperm and the egg close to each other and hope for the best. Mm. And once fertilization happened, we didn't touch the embryo. We thought, oh, you know, that's sacrosanct. You don't touch it because you, you don't want to mess it up. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, we found that we actually could be quite aggressive in doing things to the embryo to help it implant, the embryos being the, for the fertilized egg, helping the embryo implant. And then we kind of made this breakthrough where we found that we could remove a cell from an embryo and get genetic information from it. And some of the, in the very beginning in the 90s, we did things like we would test for five chromosomes, mm -hmm. the chromosomes that were most likely to be abnormal. And if there was an abnormal abnormality, it would keep the embryo from implanting. And from there, you know, fast forward 20 years, we're now taking a number of cells without harming the embryo and doing a genetic sequencing. So the same information we can get from sending a saliva sample to one of the commercial labs, and everyone you know, knows the names, 29 million people have done that in the United States. So we can find out if the chromosome count that the person carries is normal. We can find out if they carry a risk for a genetic disease cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, spinal muscular atrophy. These are things that not only do they make the probability of getting pregnant lower, but equally or more importantly, the babies that are born have a, in some case, 50% or 25% risk of developing these very serious diseases, some of which cause childhood death. So the ability to use IVF for fertile couples whose families have been plagued by diseases you know, over generations is something we can address with the procedure now. Now, the challenge we have there is, as we said before, again, is one of one of access. You know, all of IV, most of IVF being done all over the world is to treat chronic infertility. And that's a wonderful thing to be treating. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, you can you can relieve an amazing amount of suffering by helping families overcome that. Mm -hmm. But on the same hand, we've got these other very worthy things that we could be doing IVF for. But in order to kind of increase the throughput through IVF worldwide, we need to better engineer it. I'll give you some numbers. You know, we're doing worldwide, we're doing about 3 million IVF cycles. And we're helping families create somewhere around 600,000 babies. Now, it sounds like a lot. But if you add up the numbers of people that need IVF, and again, we're talking worldwide, we're somewhere between 20 and 30 million babies versus a little bit more than half a million. And that's a, that's a real public health challenge. Mm -hmm. So what can the fertility industry and the policy makers do to join forces? Because obviously this is a significant issue 
not just in the fertility industry, but as you mentioned, the world as a whole. And especially with the U.S., we know that insurance covers nothing, pretty much. The majority of insurance companies cover nothing when it comes to fertility care. So what can we do? Like, what is an effective way to collaborate with these policymakers so that it's beneficial for everybody? That's a great question. When we started mapping out the world of IVF innovation, so we're back around 2015, we came to the conclusion that the best way to deal with policy is to make it as easy as possible for them so that it's not only a good decision for you know, public health reasons, it's not only a good decision for relieving suffering, but it also makes a lot of economic sense. And the way we do that is also the way we address just the mechanics of making it possible to do 20 or 30 or 40 million cycles a year instead of 3 million. So the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to automate and standardize things as much as we can. And here we're just following the technology playbook, the same thing that went from you know, nobody owning a computer in the 1980s to everybody having one in their pockets 30 years later. You know, standardization, automation, driving costs down, making things as efficient as we can in terms of innovation and manufacturing. Second thing we needed to do, which is very specific to IVF, is we need to make the data tighter. You know, the best IVF clinics in the world are right now here in the U.S., some of them have pregnancy rates and live birth rates, actually, well over 60% by putting back one genetically normal embryo. The rest of the world is probably one-third to one-fourth of that. And there's a lot of clinics that are one-tenth of that. So by engineering and standardizing it, we're going to try to bring everybody up to that higher expectation. Now, when everyone is doing about the same in terms of outcomes, Suddenly, it's a lot easier to talk insurance speak. You know, we call something actuarial data. And the insurance industry is, you know, it's really, they just, they run a casino. You know, when you go to a casino, the casino knows exactly the odds of every blackjack hand and every poker hand and the likelihood of a payout every time someone pulls the arm on a, on a slot machine. Well, the insurance companies use similar logic in order to cover an enormous number of people for something that a relatively smaller number will need. So with IVF, one of the things, one of our goals is so that nobody has to pay for an IVF cycle if they don't have a baby. Back in the 90s, some of my patients used to say, no baby, but broke. Mm. And that's, that's, that should be an unacceptable outcome. So when you talk to people in the insurance industry and also people in the government policy side, the currency that they need is expectations. They don't want a lot of surprises. If you give them numbers that they can predict outcomes with very accurately, they will be more than happy to underwrite the financing of IVF for the world. You know, people have used the argument for decades that, oh, nobody wants to cover IVF because it's not a disease or infertility is not a disease. Well, that's to me, that's kind of a fruitless argument. Mm -hmm. It's suffering. It's something that people you know, need access to. So let's find a way to bring it to them. And you know, insurance companies cover car wrecks. That's not a disease either. Correct. But they do know for a given population of millions of people and a given number of cars, what the expectation is in terms of accidents and damage and liability and things of that sort. They feed them into their actuarial equations, which are, you know, frankly, not all that sophisticated. And if they start with good data, they can very efficiently provide coverage. Similarly, uh, governments can look at those data and they can say, okay, here's the uh, amount of cost that we're opening ourselves up to. And here's the, you know, and they can also model things like population shrinkage and people having children, those children growing up, becoming productive members of the economy. It all sounds very dry, but that's kind of the, you know, that's the language we need to speak in order to get policy people to take this all seriously. Luckily, 
right now we're kind of in this pivotal stage of IVF where the engineering is catching up to the science. The data will become actuarial. It'll become the type of numbers that you know, will go to an insurance company and they'll say, okay, we're comfortable with this. Now we can talk. And our own attitude was if the insurance companies or the insurance industry is reluctant to take this on, well, we'll just start one ourselves. We have seen over the past five, six years, a number of uh, companies that are looking to administer in, in, for infertility and, and IVF coverage for big employers. And they're actually finding that the employers are very welcoming to that because they find that offering coverage for IVF and infertility is good business, really helps in, in recruiting workers, helps in retaining workers. So, and we're not, and this is not just Google and Microsoft and Facebook. You know, right. Walmart is doing it, Starbucks is doing it. So, I think we're going to see a lot more on the policy slash macro side of people getting involved in this. What do you think, though, about, you know, unfortunately, we're in a very political divide in this country. And what do you think about the ethical concerns and the dilemmas that arise with? people's views on science and creating embryos outside of the body and scientists are trying to be God and all of these things. And then that kind of really evolves into even the political arena and how that can effectively be navigated. That's such a great question and something we've been dealing with since the first IVF baby was born in 1979. Mm. The kind of major question of IVF, good or bad, and creating an embryo outside the body. That's one where, thankfully, that ship is sailing pretty quickly. As you know, we're up to 10 million babies now, and even the people that have been most critical of in vitro fertilization as a procedure, most of them find themselves only one or two degrees of separation from a baby that was born from that technology. And that's a pretty convincing argument. You know, it's, it's like what's the, the, the joys, the miracles of having children, creating a family are, you know, they, they kind of speak for themselves. And you find that people that have theoretical concerns in an abstract sense, when faced with someone in their family not being able to have a child without the procedure, Somehow they seem to be pretty well convinced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really privileged to be on the board of directors of Resolve for a number of years. Resolve is the patient advocacy group that does just a fabulous job in speaking for people trying to have families that have difficulties. Over the years, there have been a number of laws that were proposed in state legislatures that would limit access to IVF or limit the ability to do IVF. And they find that really with just very, for all the good reasons, just education. Mm -hmm. Here's what IVF is all about. You know, here's the number of people that are affected. Here's what it does. Here's our experience with it. And again, being able to point to the 10 million babies that have been born worldwide. Uh, they, it's, it's, it's been an extremely effective you know, call it lobbying, call it education, whatever it is, but it's been very effective in kind of swaying or getting people to look at it in a much more favorable light, who's, you know, if their initial reaction was, oh, that's kind of strange, that's kind of unnatural, and they feel an aversion to it. And it's been, uh, it's been really kind of a positive experience for whom it's so important Mm -hmm. to talk to people and see that they, you know, once that they see the, you know, the human face of it, it tends to you know, often change the way they look at it. I mean, we're sitting here talking about all of these changes and all of the care and the new technology, but we also know, though, that there is a shortage of reproductive endocrinologists and the people who are able to hopefully try to make this possible. Embryologists, there's a shortage. There's a shortage of reproductive chronologists. How do we as a society really 
combat that, especially given the recent statistics that the health organization came out that one in six people are dealing with infertility. Now, I don't know how accurate that is or how vast their study was, but it's still a very telling number given when I got into this industry 23 years ago. I think it was like one in 16 or something drastic that we go from one in 16 to one in six. The, the numbers are very difficult to pin down. I guess the way I look at it is that whatever the number is, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if it's 20 million babies worldwide a year, if it's 15 million babies, that's an awful lot. It is. So the uh, so so we do really have a you know kind of a need to increase the ability to access treatment for it. The way yeah, kind of the way we look at it is. We did a very formal, you know, again, I'm going to sound like a real wonky here, kind of an input-output analysis. Look at every step of the journey from a woman just, you know, discovering she's having a hard time having a child or having a healthy child, and all the things that steps you need to do to be treated and be on the other side of that. And we identified you know, about 30, approximately 30 inefficiencies that were just organically keeping the industry from growing. Even if we had, let's say overnight, we just passed a law, IVF is free. Well, that doesn't mean we'd be creating 20 million babies the next day because we need to establish a way to have the procedures done, have them done well, and uh, make them make the type of thing that you can do. You know, a patient loses access to something like IVF for three reasons. One is she can't afford it, mm-hmm. it's just too expensive. Second, it just takes too long to do. And the third is that the life disruption is too big. You know, so you have a th- you think of a third grade teacher who can't have children of her own, because she spends all her days taking care of other people's children. It's heartbreaking. But even if I made IVF absolutely free tomorrow, an IVF cycle requires almost two weeks where you have to take two or three hours a day out of your work day to go to the office, have your blood drawn, have ultrasounds done, have procedures done. So we need to fix all of these things. And that is, you know, again, kind of the kind of the tech playbook. When we looked at those 30 inefficiencies, we were able to group them into four different areas. The first one was that we had doctors doing all sorts of stuff. Some of it requires extreme amounts of training, some of it things that anybody can do. And I can be very critical of this because I was one of those doctors. You know, I oversaw thousands and thousands of IVF cycles during my career. Secondly, we need to free up the embryologists, the scientists, from doing repetitive procedures that machines would be better off doing. They would do them more, more efficiently. They, would, they don't get tired. They can do them 24 hours a day, and they're cheaper. And the embryologists should be overseeing thousands of cycles instead of doing hundreds. Same thing with the doctors. The doctors should be overseeing thousands of cycles instead of doing 200. And we can do this. This is technology. This is not rocket science. It's, it's, less, it's less complicated technology than rocket science. Thirdly, well, IVF has grown up so the procedure is done in these big, expensive laboratories. And there were really good reasons that it grew up that way. But now we have ways of taking the procedures, closing them into a closed box that's not exposed to air and light and and temperatures, temperature fluctuations and humidity, things that are not good for eggs and sperm and embryos, we can put it into a controlled box that we can take into a different setting, plug it into the wall, and take away the need for a laboratory that costs maybe $2,000 a square foot. Those big laboratories are the biggest barrier of entry for more people coming in and doing IVF. And the fourth thing we do is we just need to bring the book, the blood, the drug prices down. And there, I've had conversations with CEOs of the drug companies, and I say, okay, we're doing three million cycles a year worldwide. If we can do twenty million cycles that need your drugs, I think we can find a happy medium somewhere because mm-hmm. these drugs cost nowhere near to make for what you charge for them. So our, you know, we took those four areas, and then we just started chipping away. Say, okay, what needs fixing? And one of the first things that needed fixing was freezing. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's, free, let's, let's take freezing from just using big old milk tanks and pouring liquid nitrogen into them to let's take 
some of the robotic technology that exists elsewhere in cell biology and cart that into IVF, and that's being done. Then we said, all right, well, what do we do about all these blood tests that people are getting done every single day? They've got to, you know, our third grade teacher, she's got to drive to the wait, drive to the IVF clinic, sit there in the big waiting room, wait to have her blood drawn, have her blood drawn, drive back, maybe have to deal with traffic. She can't show up for school at 1030 in the morning mm -hmm. every day for two weeks. So what if we could replace those blood tests with she sits down, pardon the expression, she pees in a cup. Mm -hmm puts a little dipstick into the cup. The dipstick talks to her phone. Mm -hmm. The phone sends the results to the cloud. The IVF clinic gets the results 6.30 in the morning. You don't have to go to the office at all. Mm -hmm. It's another thing we can do. You know, it's cheaper, easier. You don't need to big, build the big waiting room. You don't have to have people waiting there to draw the blood. You don't have to send the blood to the laboratory. Just do a simple urine dipstick. Now, if we address all 30 of those little bottlenecks with solutions like this. And then we tackle the next 30 and we bring the cost of IVF way, way down. And at the same time, when we automate this stuff, we start, well, we start getting things that we can measure out of the automation. That tells us why one clinic has a 60% pregnancy rate, one has a 16% pregnancy rate. And we teach this pregnancy, the clinic with the 16% rate, how to get up to the 60 but do these technologies already exist or is it something that we still have to go and create? All of the above. Okay. Some of them are in, some are in the marketplace now yeah, and they're making their way in. Some of them are in, you know, being tested and developed. And some of them are kind of in waiting because other technologies need to be developed alongside of them. You know, for example, once we close up the laboratory work, that goes from retrieving the egg to freezing the egg. And we put that into a suitcase. You know, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but we put it into a suitcase, plug it into the wall, and then we retrieve the eggs, and the eggs go right into this machine. So we can take that all out of the laboratory. And if I'm a big, if I'm running a big IVF clinic and I've got this $2,500 square foot laboratory that's working at capacity, so I can't take any other patients. Maybe I can take that suitcase and stick it in the procedure room that costs $200 square foot to build. Mm. Or maybe I could put it out into a satellite clinic closer to where my third grade teachers live so they don't have to travel out to the IVF clinic in a big city. Or maybe I can contract with a big OBGYN group that doesn't have an infertility specialist. And to be honest, there's nothing technically that difficult that a reproductive endocrinologist does that a well-trained OBGYN or surgical assistant or midwife can't do, mm -hmm. that the, the, again, that the reproductive endocrinologist should be overseeing. Let's get them off the shop floor and get them up and doing executive function, overseeing thousands of cycles. We can move that suitcase, that lab in, the, in a suitcase into the procedure room in the IVF clinic pretty easily. We can do it out to their satellite office that has a doctor a reproductive endocrinologist rotating through every once in a while. To get it out to the OBGYNs and the other group, there we need like some support software, things of that sort. Mm. There we need to kind of bring in artificial intelligence to crunch through all the lab numbers and all the hormone levels that the urine testing generates to help tell them what to do so that the Reproductive endocrinologists don't have to flip through tens of thousands of charts each day and all these lab tests. Now, this is all doable. And frankly, there's 24 companies worldwide that are working on perfecting artificial intelligence use within the IVF field. Mm -hmm. It's kind of grown up organically. It's like we think of Silicon Valley and computers and things like yep. that. Same kind of ecosystem exists in life sciences and very much so in IVF. So uh, this stuff is happening. Of course, it's not happening fast enough. Of course. You know, it never does. That's something yeah. that always bothered me. As we were developing new technologies in even the 90s and early 2000s, I always kind of went to sleep a little bit unhappy at night knowing that there's people that tomorrow they're going to lose their ability to use this stuff. And, you know, they can't wait till next year. But, uh, you know, the nice thing is now it's working a lot faster than it used to pace of innovation is going a lot faster than it used to. 
I mean, we're talking about innovation, millions of babies being born by IVF, but we also need to probably incorporate in the conversation third-party reproduction, because in some cases, this is not going to be possible for many without the assistance of third-party reproduction. But we also know now that there is a shortage of gestational surrogates or carriers. There is, in some instances, shortages of donors or you know, lack of women who want to go through that process of becoming an egg donor. I mean, it is it's it's a lot to go through for your body. You want to help somebody, but it's just like, I don't want to have to go through that process. There's a shortage of specific sperm donors where people in various diverse backgrounds don't even have the capability to be able to have someone that looks similar to them to be able to complete their family. So how can these advancements that we're discussing even overlap into the third party world and be able to, you know, help the dynamics there? Great question. And here we have to break into two areas. There's the stuff we can do now. And then there's the stuff that we'll be doing sort of not the distant future, but we need to take a couple of big scientific jumps before we can. Now, the virtuous part about the stuff we're doing now, which is just the kind of boring engineering to make it easier to do an IVF cycle, to do it an easier, to make it easier to do an IVF cycle closer to where you are, mm. and to just increase the number of people that can go through safely and effectively and have a you know least bad experience. I know mean, nobody thinks of IVF as a good experience, but trying to make it at least tolerable. Each of those makes it easier to do a donor cycle as it is to a non-donor cycle. Makes it easier to take the process of being able to donate eggs closer to where you live. You know, one of the problems with IVF in general, for no matter how you do it, is it's really centralized in big urban centers. You know, it's like you can, you know, I, I'm in New York and you can't, you know, you there's a there's an IVF center next to every Starbucks, it seems. You know, it's like it's it's very, very accessible, which is great if you live in New York. If you need egg donors in New York, it makes it easier for the egg donors that are in New York. But if you're an egg donor, potentially, even if you're something that you are you know, willing or, or want to do, if you're living in a rural area, then it's really difficult. And you can't, you, you're there. It's not even a matter of driving back and forth for an hour or two each morning. It's you've got to literally move somewhere for a good period of time. So all the technologies that we're developing now to make IVF more effective, make it work better, and make it more accessible, both in terms of being in it more inexpensive and closer to where the individuals are, that's all going to help. That's going to help uh, a lot of the donor community. Uh, even on the male side, yeah, there are some men who would be appropriate donors who their sperm doesn't freeze well, so they can only do it fresh. If you do it fresh, you've got to be there where, where it's needed to do the fertilization. So moving IVF closer to individuals, make it more geographically diverse, helps the entire third-party IVF part very, very well. Now, that said, there are, you know, there is a limited number of people that will donate eggs, donate sperm, or even more limited who will act as a surrogate. Mm-hmm. Even, you know, even for surrogacy, if we can bring that process closer to where they are. That's a help. But that's one that's probably going to be the toughest one. You know, that's it is a, you know, it's a nine month commitment. It's a pledge to, you know, live in a healthy way. And and the surrogates that we've met are just, you know, what wonderful people. Uh, On the same hand, it, it is a relatively small number of people. There, I don't know if we're ever going to get to the point where. We don't need to, you know, we're going to be incubating babies to maturity out of the body. That's still right now in science fiction. But one of the things that we started seeing just the past few years that absolutely amazed me, which I didn't think we'd ever see, was effective uterine transplants, which just blew me out of the water. Like, I try to think I'm pretty open-minded, and there's nothing I think can't happen. 
Well, hats off to the people, and I believe there were scientists in Sweden that did the first cases, but they're being done you know, in limited places all over the world now. You can take a uterus from one person, transplant it to someone else, and that person can carry a healthy baby. I, I <laughs> to me, that's something I never thought I would see in my lifetime. Will it become routine? I don't know, because it's still in its very early stages. But that is something that if we can get it to being a cost-effective and uniformly safe intervention, that could be an enormous step forward for everyone. Now, on the egg and the sperm side, we are working with technologies like stem cells that will allow us to either exactly or functionally recreate eggs and sperm. Now, this also sounds like science fiction, but uh, we, we, we will get there. It's something that uh, is going to you know, going to be a lot of hurdles, scientifically, technically, and then very much so in the regulatory sense. You know, we have to figure out just how do we safely start making human embryos that may turn into babies and know that we're confident enough that we're not doing harm in order to get there. But that is something where the, the, the scientific tools are there. We just have to do it methodically, carefully, ethically, and in a way that, again, does no harm. But these are things that will, you know, will become available to us at some point in the future. Now, the growth of using egg donation since IVF was invented has been really remarkable. And the best way that we've scaled that so far is that the number of eggs we need for each baby born is much lower. So it used to be that you know, we'd make, we retrieve 20 eggs, we'd fertilize 12 of them. We pretty much had to use all of those to get one baby. And we were putting back three or four. Of course, that meant that the twins, triplets, quadruplets were too high, but that was just because it was a very inefficient procedure. Now, in most cases, we put back one and we save others. You know, again, this is going to sound very crap. I'm using very, you know, very dry terms. The yield for each time we retrieve eggs is much higher. And, uh, you know, I recognize that these are very painful things that we're treating and we're really meeting an enormous need for people. I always hate trying to come, pulling out engineering and accounting terms, but, you know, that's, we need to do it. You know, if we want to do it effectively, not only do we have to be good, compassionate doctors, but we need to be good scientists and good engineers to make all this happen. So both on the, you know, the egg side, the surrogate side, the sperm side, just by making IVF work better, make it more efficient per egg or embryo created, making the uh, probability of giving people that would want to be surrogates or donors, make it easier for them to do so. Mm -hmm. And inventing new stuff, the same the way we invented an ability to transplant uterus over the you know recently, we'll find other ways to do that as well. Very long-winded answer to your question. No, <laughs> but it's great. I'm like I'm so fascinated. It this is great. My last question is: I'm going to have you like peer into the future. Okay. <laughs> In twenty years from now, what do you hope? will have transpired from this conversation to, you know, 20 years where hopefully I'll be talking to my grandchildren about all of the technologies and advances in this field? Well, hopefully, in a way, IVF will be boring. Mm. Hopefully, you know, it's like the, the, when, when we sat down to map all this out, we said, okay, what do we want the system to look like? Well, first, I, you know, we want it as ubiquitous and as available as dentistry. You know, so if you need it, it's there and it's close to you. So it's like you don't have to try. It's like it's just not a remarkable thing to have to do. Secondly, we want the outcomes to be the same no matter where you go. So that everywhere you go, there's a level of certainty. It may not be 100%, but we'll be able to tell you exactly what the likelihood is. You're not going to have to you know, do tremendous amounts of work to try to find where you should go. You, you should have that confidence 
that it's being done to a standard of care that really works no matter where you go. You know, it's something like laser eye surgery. Mm-hmm. It's not a perfect procedure, but mm-hmm. you know, when it was first introduced, there's a little operator dependency there. Now it's pretty much plug and play. Thirdly, we want it to say we want it to be affordable in two ways. We don't want not being able to afford to do IVF a barrier to having a family. You know, it's just, it's just too important. You know, it's 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 one of the it's you know, if you're hungry, there's always a place to go to at least not be hungry again. Mm-hmm. If you need to sleep, you know, we're we it's it's a responsibility we should be undertaking as a society to provide people a safe and you know safe warm and dry place to sleep similarly having children is right up there in that yeah you know, I, I i worked with people that couldn't have children for a very very long time and this is not consumer discretionary as we say in, in the business world this is this is true true health care so you don't want a, the affordability of an ivf cycle to keep anybody from having a family the other part of that is we get to a point where you're paying for an outcome you shouldn't be buying ivf cycles that don't work and again, this comes down to risk management. It really, it's like IVF, and this is, you know, it's this isn't because anyone's evil, you know, but the way IVF grew is like you'd pay for an IVF cycle. And if it worked, great. If it didn't work, well, unfortunately, it was a knowledgeable consumer decision that you made. But the problem was that that limited IVF to a tiny percentage of the people in the world. That's not fair. It's, you know, it's like IVF hurts no matter who you are. You know, if uh, what neighborhood you live in, if you live, if your ancestors came from Northern Europe or from somewhere else, and unfortunately, it's been very much one demographic that's had access to IVF. So let's change that, and let's change this. That's close to you. It's affordable, and you don't feel that. You know, it's a lot of people, even if they can't afford IVF or to, to do an IVF cycle, don't want to do it. Because that kind of optionality, the unfairness of paying and coming up with nothing, is just something they just can't face. So let's take that off the table too. You know, the years ago, I remember talking to somebody and saying, "Well, it's a big deal. It's like IVF. It's like what's the cost of a small Toyota?" And I say, "Well, you know, frankly, not everybody can afford a sort small Toyota. But even Correct. if you can, if you walk into a Toyota dealer with seventeen thousand dollars, I think that's the cheapest sticker price, you will drive out with a Toyota." If you pay seventeen thousand dollars for an IVF cycle, you're getting a chance of having the cycle work. A lot of people, even with that seventeen thousand dollars, is sitting in their bank account, don't want to spend it and come away with nothing. So let's risk manage that. Let's pay a little bit more when it does work, so that nobody pays a tremendous amount for nothing. So these are you know these are kind of the kind of the three pillars of what we saw what the future IVF world should look like. It's available everywhere. It works at the highest level everywhere. And you don't pay if it doesn't work. And that's what I'd like to see. You said 20 years. I'd like to see it before then. But if it's 20, 20 years, okay, we'll, we'll settle for that. But let's, let's, let's see if we can do that in 10. That would be amazing. I mean, that would just be amazing. And I mean, we're sitting here talking about you know, all of these abilities. The other thing about if we're not reproducing country, the people that are here will eventually die away. If we're not repopulating, who's going to keep the world going? That's a really good question. We studied that over the past couple of years. There are 4.2 million 32-year-olds and about the same amount of 33-year-olds and 34-year-olds. Most babies in the U.S. now are born to people over 30. Mm. Well, last year we made 3.7 million babies. That's a big difference between mm. the people that are making the babies and the number of babies we're having. And in some cases, people don't want to have as many children. That's an individual decision. That's okay. But most of that is because it's the waiting to get pregnant until later in life, which is a rational decision. And the chance of getting of having a child each time you try to get pregnant in your 30s is at a heck of a lot lower than it is in your early 20s. Mm-hmm. We looked at the 16 biggest economies, the best developed economies in the world, and looked at the what's called the total fertility rate, the TFR, which is the number of children a woman would has during her reproductive lifespan. And population replacement is 2.1. That's the magic number. 
Mm. You'd think, well, two, because you're replacing yourself and your partner. Well, the point one, unfortunately, is because of childhood mortality. So if you have to be 2.1, every one of those 16 were below that. In some cases, very below that. And if you if you multiply the just the difference between your TFR and the 2.1 times the population, you come up with the yearly population deficit. And you add those 16 countries up, 10 million babies per year hmm. that China and the United States and Japan and a lot of countries all over the world are not replacing the current populations. And you know, you, you asked a very good question. Well, you know, in countries like Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, there's a very major problem in that who takes care of the people as they get older? Mm-hmm. You know, who really who provides for the economy to support people as they leave the economy? You can only do so much with technology. So uh, it is. It's this is a big policy issue, and something that I you know some, some countries already are addressing it. Japan is going to make IVF extremely accessible. China is essentially making it free now. In Israel, IVF is free until you've had two children. In Belgium and Sweden, IVF accounts for ten percent of the babies that are born. In the U.S., it's about two percent. Mm. So there's a lot of ways, a lot of country variation that's going to be needed to have creative solutions to address this new, like we look at it from the point of view of families yep. that are trying to you know, fill an enormous void in their lives. But from a policy standpoint, yeah, if I'm, if I'm thinking, what's the United States going to look like 15, 20, 25 years from now? I'm concerned about how we keep our population healthy. You know, growing or at least stable and there's only two ways to do it you know have more babies or increase net immigration and i happen to be a big believer in the benefits of immigration Mm -hmm. but unfortunately it's something that a lot of people aren't too enthusiastic about so okay if if you're not going to do it that way let's address it in terms of the population we have now who are not having children that they want to have you really nailed you it nailed an enormous societal question with you know with that question yeah wow david thank you so much for your time in this discussion uh, i knew when i saw you at the conference i was like that's who has to talk to us on the hunt that episode about the future of fertility so it has been my pleasure to have you join me today oh what a privilege it was to talk with you and i'm happy to answer your questions anytime thank you so much take care now Thank you so much for listening. If you found this episode helpful, please rate Fertility Cafe on your favorite listening platform and share this episode with anyone you think could benefit from hearing it. Tune in next week for another amazing episode on Fertility Cafe. Until then, remember, love has no limits. Neither should parenthood.